you guys want to, I'll let Jessica kick it off now. Hello there. So we're going to try to get the formatting correct so that we've just got the um, three legislators and myself showing if that is at all possible. Bridget you might have to turn your video off. Here we go. Do gallery for now. So thank you for coming today to um, give us an update on what happened this session. It was quite a unique experience, I'm sure. And so we're really eager to hear what it was like for you guys. Um, so if it's OK, I'm just going to call on you randomly based on where you are on the screen and have you go ahead and share um, a bit about what your experience was with the session this year. And then I'll move to the next legislator and we'll do that for all three and then we'll follow up with some questions. So I would like to start with Miss Liz Lovelet. Hey there, good morning. Uh, I, I feel like I've met almost everybody on this call or at least been on another. We did a lot of chamber calls over the course of the interim. So glad to see everybody back here today on this gorgeous sunny day. Um, so Liz Lovelet representing well, you know where we are. And I was your city council member for a long time prior to that. So I won't go into that piece. So challenges with a virtual session. I think there were some opportunities and certainly some constraints um, based on the fact that we were all remote. Um, as many of you know, uh, for those of you that have um, had the pleasure of going down and testifying in Olympia, uh, one thing that I really uh, am excited to continue uh, as we move forward with future legislative sessions is the ability to testify remotely. This was a huge boon on the ability for, for folks to participate. I mean, personally, I remember as a council member going down to testify at a hearing um, many years ago now, but you know, you spend the whole day to go have one minute of testimony. And so what I love, and you know, even harder if you're you know, east of the mountains, and we've, we've seen whole delegations of people come out from different parts of the state. And so one of the things that I loved was the ability for people to participate remotely. We got so much more participation, thousands of people signing in to, to support or to oppose different pieces of legislation. And that piece was really fantastic. And I'm, I'm glad that we can continue to go forward with that ability for, for more people to participate in that piece of democracy. It certainly had its inherent challenges. I mean, this job is, um, it's one part policy and about three parts relational. Uh, so, so much of it has to do with the conversations that you have with other members, with stakeholders, with staff. And for us, normally that can happen in the wings in a minute uh, when we're on the floor talking to different colleagues about what their concerns might be with a bill and how to bring them on board, what kind of language we might need to amend to, to continue a bill through the process. So that was definitely very challenging because, you know, we were, we're on these meetings all day long. And so then we're taking, you know, phone calls or, or adding them on at the end of the day to be able to have some of those real kind of basic conversations about how, how the bills function, how they move, questions, concerns. So while that did provide some interesting hurdles, uh, we had a monumental session by any metric. Uh, we managed to get 334 bills out, 310 of which had bipartisan support. Uh, massive sweeping uh, changes in police accountability and reform around tax fairness, uh, around health equity, um, just so many issues dealing with homelessness and eviction and, and really trying to be thoroughly responsive to where we are uh, in the pandemic, uh, you know, as, as we've had these conversations throughout the course of interim to figure out how best to continue to both uh, serve our constituencies, serve the greater good of public health, um, and additionally, to just make sure that we are continuing to be a strong conduit for folks um, from the local level to the state and, and to the feds, you know, making sure that we have that, that continuity in our communication chain uh, going and flowing so that we can get, you know, concerns elevated. Um, so, yeah, lots of bills that we all worked on. I'm sure some you love, some you hate. The thing about this job is that we, at best, we can hope to make 50% of the people happy 50% of the time, because that's just the nature of the job. Um, but we all, uh, our team, I'm really proud of the work that we did as a delegation. Um, we 
talked continuously throughout the session. We really wanted to make sure, and a big shout to our staff, Amanda and Kaylee and Jordan, who are here today, to make sure that our, our district has a no wrong door policy. So if you came to uh, any, any one of the folks in our office, we want to make sure that if you needed to have um, an ESD case elevated, or if you had a particular you know, consideration with a, a state agency that you needed help uh, dealing with, that regardless of, of whom you initially contacted, that we would make sure you got in touch with the right person to get those needs met. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it short and sweet because we do have a lot of questions and I see my seatmates are here. So real quick before we move to the next legislator, um, is there any specific legislation that you're particularly proud of with you and your team this year? Well, the only I only had one bill this year, and it has to do with the creation of a tax incentive for the development of community-based farm worker housing. Uh, so I was just out in Yakima last week signing a suite of healthcare and uh, worker protection bills. Uh, one bill I think we should all be really proud of is the fact that we now have um, a phased in approach for agricultural workers to receive overtime pay, uh, second in the nation, and that's a huge deal. And we're, we're circumventing a lot of legal uh, issues. Um, I mean, we had a huge year for the climate, every, but one bill that I, I'll uh, just speak briefly to, and then I, I know uh, Representative Lakanoff worked on quite a bit, is the HEAL Act. So incorporating um, concepts of environmental justice, meaning making sure that communities that have traditionally borne the brunt of um, environmental degradation uh, are, are going to be considered uh, as we move forward with different state agencies so that they're not we're not continuing to deepen the harm that they have already experienced, both in, in um, kind of environmental on the ground circumstances, but also long term health um, ramifications. So those are a couple of things that I'm I'm particularly excited about. Well, you are on some fascinating committees, environment, energy and technology is one housing and local government, that one's huge, and transportation. Wow, you were very busy this session. <laughs> and I'm, the, I'm the Senate chair of the Ferry Legislator Caucus, and I just got appointed to uh, JLARC, which is the Joint Legislative Audit and Review Committee. So um, I have a position now to help monitor our studies um, over time. Wow, awesome. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that. We'll go ahead and hear from Alex now. Thanks, Jessica. Thanks for the uh, the invitation to be here today. Um, Liz covered a lot of the uh, a lot of sort of the the big overview. Uh, I won't recover that ground, um, but I, I will just share sort of one sort of perhaps sort of humanizing part about being uh, in the. Um, you know, in this virtual legislative session. I was um, elected to be the, the deputy majority whip uh, for the Democratic Caucus in the House. Um, and I think if if you maybe have watched uh, or read about Lyndon Johnson or, or, or others, uh, you may have sort of a, a view of what the whip's responsibilities are that involves poking people in the chest and yelling at them to vote your way. Mostly it's just trying to get people to show up on time and, um, um, you know, be there when the votes uh, are going to happen so that we know uh, that, that we've got the folks in the room that it will take to, to get our work done. Um, that is a challenge in a regular legislative session. This year, it was, there, there was a unique challenge to it, which is just that um, we all are accustomed to trying to do work while we're on the floor uh, legislating. And when we're, when we're in the session, uh, there's no way to turn off the sound of the bell that tells us when it's time to vote. Um, and if somebody doesn't catch it for whatever reason, there's plenty of people um, sitting next to them or in the next room who can say, hey, it's time to vote, you got to show up. Um, we didn't have that um, this time. You were sitting in your living room and if you decided to take a call from somebody during the, during the, during the voting, you might Put your uh, turn down the volume and, and not hear that it was time to vote and everybody is waiting for you and your name's being called. Um, so a lot of my job ended up just being trying to figure out how to make sure we got folks uh, to pay attention and, and to remain focused. Um, and one of the one of the tricks we got was to um, set it so that the number I would text folks from uh, was an emergency contact. So no matter what they set their phone to, it automatically uh, would ring through. Um, 
So just just highlight a couple of, of things that, that I worked on and then uh, get ready to, to respond to, to your questions. Um, two bills that I worked on that passed, uh, one uh, creates sort of a planning structure around vehicle electrification. So we know EVs are a growing part of our uh, vehicle fleet in Washington state and around the country. Uh, we know that's gonna get bigger and bigger and we just need to make sure that we know that there's gonna be adequate charging infrastructure for them, that the, um, that the power is gonna be there, that there's power lines and substations to be able to support that. And there's the electricity generation. Um, on the on the back end, so it's it's really sort of a, a detailed planning bill um, to just make sure we're ready for that clean energy future as it as we move towards it. Uh, the other piece of legislation I worked on is really just a response to the pandemic, um, and the Department of Licensing has a huge backlog. If, um, if you yourself or uh, you know anybody who's trying to get uh, the license renewed recently. I'm sure you've encountered this. We've heard from lots of folks who've, who've run into this. Um, and unfortunately that backlog isn't something that they're gonna catch up on in the next couple of months or um, they, they could be behind for years. And some of how they're dealing with it is emergency powers that we know aren't gonna be there forever. So it's, it's really just sort of um, allowing them to do more things online um, and allowing them to expedite the process. And one of the upshots of that will be if, in the future, if you wanna get uh, a driver's license renewal instead of for six years, you'll have the option now to get it for eight. That'll save us money, it'll save you time. Um, and so it's just some efficiencies in the program. Um, and then one other bill that I worked on that would just highlight for this group, um, the multifamily tax exemption is a program that the state has had for years. Um, that encourages uh, dense development and affordable development with a uh, temporary property tax exemption for building apartment buildings in, in particular areas. Uh, the, the committee was has just joined JWARC, uh, came out a couple of years ago with some, uh, some recommendations on how that program could work better and we implemented many of those recommendations as well as um, creating a new program that I'm especially excited about that has a longer term uh, property tax exemption with the intention of creating affordable homes that will be ownership. So think about like a community land trust um, with a condominium. Um, so it's an opportunity for folks who are making less than median wages to still be able to buy a home and build wealth over time but keeping that unit affordable for the next buyer. Um, so looking forward to answering questions, but uh, I'll wrap it up there uh, for now. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, and I wanted to point out your committees as well. So you are also on the Environmental Committee Finance, Rules, and then Transportation. So I love that we have so much representation at transportation. And then now the what? Congratulations. Thank you. And then next up, we'd love to have Ms. Deborah Lekanoff speak. Hi, it's good to see so many of you guys. It was an incredible session. I think as uh, my colleagues have said, the incredible relationship that we have with Senator Lovelet and Representative Rammel just really, uh, it, it's, it's, it's been an amazing session when we worked together and we were face to face. It was even an even more amazing session uh, during this virtual uh, virtual legislative session. And and I do I have to raise my hands to Amanda Kaylee and Jordan. Uh, we couldn't do the work that we do without them. Uh, you know I really have to appreciate Amanda. I think uh, the voice that she brings out of um, Anna Cordes. Uh, has been phenomenal. We often go to her and Liz and say what needs to get done there. Uh, the uh, ability that um, in working with Kaylee, who knows uh, from the north up in Whatcom through the Skagit, uh, has been really great to work with as well as her friendship and Jordan's friendship. You know, we had a great year uh, in the state legislature and who would have ever thought we would have passed so many monumental bills amongst a COVID crisis, an economic crisis, and then uh, during a time of recognizing uh, racism and incorporating equity and diversity uh, throughout Washington state in almost every piece of legislature that we have. Uh, one of the first and foremost exciting bills I thought was uh, great was the early childhood um, and childcare 
bills that we worked on. Uh, the three of us sat in numerous meetings with elected officials, childcare, labor, uh, and many of you uh, joined with us and reminded us that we cannot have economic sustainability or economic development unless we invest in early child care centers. We help relieve and find funding for our child care providers and that we recognize that um, not only our YMCA, but our Boys and Girls Club, but the small child care uh, mom and pop um, uh, centers that take care of our children, uh, they need sustainability, they need funding, they need assistance, and they need relief. So from the federal to the state perspective, I think we did an incredible job. I've got to thank uh, Senator, um, uh, I'm sorry, Representative um, Sen and our Senator from the other side, Liz, who worked on it. Senator Claire Wilson. Senator Claire Wilson for their leadership that they had. I also thought we did an incredible job, which I was really uh, appreciative to work with Liz on the Senate and then uh, Alex on the House side in the Finance Committee. There's a lot of restructuring and helping our small businesses. Uh, there's a lot of work we did with um, Representative uh, Stokesbury and Representative Ty, also our senators on the other side on the Working Families Tax Credit. It was as simple as this. Um, we need to give funding back to some of our most vulnerable communities. And the three of us represent some of the most vulnerable communities. I think the UI relief in the business, uh, the the um, unemployment insurance was really hit hard. Uh, Senate Bill 5478, uh, Senate Bill 5061, which is also House Bill 1098, really prevented 1.7 million in and unemployment insurance, uh, the, two, the 2021 tax increases due to the pandemic, you know, helping our small businesses uh, that would, would have been impacted uh, by the unemployment insurance, I think was really important to us. And I can't tell you, right, Liz and Alex, almost every conversation that we had uh, together or with fellow legislators or with the governor's office or with agencies or with the labor committees with us, with uh, Chair Kaiser or Chair Sells, uh, all wrapped back around helping small businesses. Uh, many, many discussions on that. You know, Liz was a champion on always remembering and reminding us that our music vendors uh, need to be remembered and addressed, our arts and humanities. Uh, Alex consistently reminded us about, you know, labor and putting people to work and developing workforce development. Uh, we were championing conversations on uh, small businesses and helping support and partner with representative rules in the Main Street program, which is House Bill 1279, where rural small businesses, and we are rural in the 40th, uh, rural small businesses in Washington are being hurt and are really important to address those immediate storefronts down in Mount Vernon, down in Burlington, walking down Anacortes, uh, walking through San Juan. These are small businesses that we need to help. And then some of the bills that I was really excited to work on uh, really was um, House Bill uh, 1117, which did not pass this year, which has a good chance for 2022. Uh, it really was taking a look at incorporating salmon recovery into the local governments and having local governments, cities and counties support this of wanting to be incorporated into receiving funding to do the salmon recovery so they would not be next in line to be sued uh, for not fulfilling uh, a responsibility for including culverts. And um, I'm gonna guess you guys probably believe a lot like I would that we'd rather have, uh, don't tell our attorneys this, plug your ears. We'd rather have good policy and good funding and doing the right thing the first time around rather than spending 17 to 20 years in court fighting over uh, trying to do the right thing when we could take those legal funding and legal money at the state, federal, local level and at the tribal level and invest it back into our communities. Good infrastructure, homelessness, affordable housing, small business investment, infrastructure. We love that word in, up in the 40th. Um, and we just got to say, you know, if we couldn't get House Bill 1117 through this year, we'll get it through next year and we're already working on that. Uh, the climate change um, bills that we worked on, we had 13 climate change bills, but a lot of it really recognized some of the conservative side of, and I'll say it, that we're looking for in the 40th. We've got uh, four refineries, two right here in Liz and mine's backyard. You know, I look across the, the Samish Flats and I, I see them. Those are 300 jobs uh, per refinery. Those jobs are important to us. Workforce development is important to us. The refineries are our neighbors. They're our brothers. They're our sisters. They're the ones who are the coaches for our, our Little League games. And thank God we get to get out and play Little League this summer, we hope. You know, this, this is our community members. Um, I think also uh, we did a lot of education reform 
this year underneath the COVID crisis, redeveloping new ways of which we're going to incorporate education tools and education methodologies, but not only in education, in healthcare. Telehealth is really important. Our hospitals and our areas, and, and Liz championed that and Alex championed that on incorporating capacity and implementation development for new ways of how we're gonna provide healthcare uh, to our community members. So our wingspan is wide, but I've got two great representatives. Um, our, I got one great representative, <laughs> Alex, who sits next to me, and I've got an incredible senator uh, who brings a wealth of information and leadership on, on the Senate side. So we know that we're always taken care of and that we're doing a lot of good things together. That was a lot, Jessica. I'm long-winded. I've been on Zoom all morning since about seven. So sorry about that. <laughs> you are ready. <laughs> yeah, it's been a busy morning. I love it. Well, I wanna, I wanna say what your committees are as well, just to kind of follow suit. So state government and tribal relations, the vice chair, appropriations, Rural Development, Agriculture, and Natural Resources. Fabulous. And then I wanted to ask real quick, so you had mentioned unemployment insurance help for businesses. Can you talk just a brief little bit more sure. on that? So, so Senate Bill uh, 5478 was uh, hosted by Senator Kaiser, who's chair of the, the Labor uh, Committee on the other side. You know, in February, the legislature also passed Senate Bill 5061, which is House Bill 1098 which prevented 1.7 billion in unemployment insurance in the 2021 tax that increases due to the pandemic. So Senate Bill 5478 um, goes further by providing relief to employers and economic sectors that were required to close the public or suffering significant losses due to the COVID-19 um, to the COVID measures in 2020 and 2021. Uh, so, um, Jessica, this bill includes restaurants, hotels, movie theaters, gyms, bowling alleys, retail outs, outlets, and others. So without the bill, those businesses would have seen a massive spike in UI taxes in 2022 due to the historical large number of the workers who received um, UI benefits during the pandemic. The other one that really was important, I think that you guys would appreciate, and Liz and Alex worked on this also, was the COVID-19 Re, um, relief funds tax exemptions, which was House Bill 1095, which is represented, which was uh, introduced by the incredible, you guys, if you get to know a small business representative who really speaks and walks the talk, it's Representative Whalen on the House. Uh, she comes out of the Snohomish area. She's a small business owner. Her bill was focused on this. Um, you know, our small businesses are hurting. We knew that, we heard it. Uh, they need help and certainty. Um, they didn't want to be able to, so the bill, they need to help and, and certainly should be taxed on the, the very funds that have kept them afloat. So her bill ensured that the state and federal funds designated to aid small businesses during the pandemic stayed with those small businesses. So House Bill 1095 exempts small businesses from paying state taxes on funds received from the federal and state government for COVID relief. It may seem small, but if I understood correctly in the testimony and hearing from Representative Whalen, you know, fifty dollars to five hundred dollars uh, to twenty thousand is 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 a lot. No matter what dollar small businesses could save, every little bit helped during this time. And my colleagues and I really heard that well and partnered with our our other legislative colleagues when they were working on small businesses. And Kaylee can send you. I'm sure Amanda and Jordan have it too. Just a quick summary. Of like what these tax reliefs look like to help small businesses um, that you can share out with your colleagues that they can look into. That would be fantastic. Thank yeah. you. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start reading a couple questions. And so my thought is, we'll um, we'll start with Liz and then go to Alex and then Deborah. Kind of just stay in that same order if that's okay. And if one of you isn't really um, in a committee or around that type of question, feel free to pass it to the next person. So, yeah, I think we may have to do a bit of that because the questions are definitely like based on our committee assignments and kind of policy wheelhouse. We might need yep. to jump around a little bit. <laughs> that works. Um, so I did want to let the, the watchers know we did send these out ahead of time because some of them are bill specific. So we wanted to make sure that the representatives had a chance to pull up all the data from that specific bill. 
So the first question I'm going to ask is about rebuilding the child care system. Deborah did touch on this a little bit. Um, there, the question was on supporting our state's economic recovery and how they go hand in hand. Um, it could be very expensive to overhaul child care and finding the money could definitely be a big hurdle. So how will you work to expand or rebuild our early childhood education for daycare industry in Washington state? And we'll start with Liz. Yeah, so we made a significant stride this year with the Fair Start for Kids Act. Uh, as uh, Representative Lukanoff mentioned earlier, Senator Claire Wilson is just a fiery champion for all things that have to do with, as she would say, our littles. Uh, and so she worked really hard to get this bill through um, with Rep Sen in the House. So it stabilizes and expands the child care industry by increasing subsidy rates and resources for professional development, um, working on things like non-standard hour care, uh, how we kind of calibrate um, getting the workforce trained um, and able to provide those services both in home and in a, in a um, you know, facility setting. Uh, we reduce the co-pays for families who are accessing the Working Connection uh, child care and extended and expanded the eligibility for more families to participate in that. Uh, and then we have, um, we strengthen different um, intervention services around mental health consultations for families uh, as they're entering the child care system. So, and then, and then we, we paired this with the capital gains tax to make, make sure that it has a uh, funding source to move um, into the future. So put a quick pin in that. I understand that the capital gains is contentious with lots of people. 9,000 pe people in Washington state will be paying this tax. So it is definitely really geared towards um, uh, you know, folks with stocks and bonds and other things. It's not for businesses. It's not for your retirement account. It's not for your real property. Etc. Um, so what this does is it gives us a huge uh, leap forward on expanding access to affordable child care. And this is something that I heard as consistently as a council member and have talked many times to, to this organization about is how do you uh, how do you get especially women into the workforce in the absence of quality childcare? And what we found during the pandemic was that women were four to five times more likely to have to exit uh, employment and, and that support for their family because they needed to take uh, back on that role of full-time parenting. And we still haven't gotten all those women back to work. And, you know, on a year when we we put a lot of effort and emphasis on frontline workers and essential workers in our communities. These are the very people who would likely qualify for these kinds of childcare um, facility or, or you know childcare co-payments and things. So this was a this was a big step. I'm really proud to have supported this. A lot of stakeholdering went into it. This was not a small bill, uh, and we had excellent feedback from the business sector, from childcare providers themselves about. You know, what were the barriers to providing these kinds of services? Is it the licensure? Is it, you know, the portability of, you know, their background checks for getting their employees in? So they really did a deep dive on, on you know, identifying those barriers and figuring out the best ways to remove them. And then also putting enough money in that we can actually afford to continue this program. Not to say that there isn't more work to go. I mean, we particularly have some work to do around infant care. That is one of the most challenging um, aspects of, of the child care spectrum. Uh, but yeah, we made, a, we made a big step forward this year and we'll just continue to, to keep an eye on it. Awesome, thank you. Alex, anything to add? Um, yeah, I, I guess I would just say, you know, we, we made investments in child care in both, you know, we passed our budget in two stages this year because of the, um, the urgency of, of getting money out the door to support economic recovery. And you saw significant investments in child care in both, uh, in both what we call first step, which, where we invested uh, first 50 million and then, um, and then fully funding the, um, the um, Fair Start for Kids Act. Um, in the um, in the final budget that we passed, um, so I, I think it really is a budget priority, not just for those of us in the 40th district, but for the legislature as a whole. Um, and I think you can anticipate, especially because, as Liz mentioned, there's uh, that commitment uh, to dedicate that the revenue from capital gains for these priorities. Um, this is something that that I think you can anticipate the legislature is going to be continuing to invest in for. Uh, for time to come. And I think that the, the argument for that is um, bolstering everything that Liz said, but it would just add that it's also so important uh, for children. 
um, this is some of the best long-term investment we could be spending. Um, research has demonstrated since the 90s that so many indicators of how well people do later in life um, go back to um, did they get a good start uh, in early childhood education and preschool? Being able to go to preschool correlates later in life to reduced likelihood of committing crimes. It correlates to uh, whether somebody is likely to have a uh, retirement account when they're 40. Um, it just really does set people up well, and it's an investment that's worth making for sure. Thank you. Deborah, anything from your point of view? Yeah, I'll, I'll just tie it up real quick. Um, you know, one of the things I learned when I came out and I sat down with uh, in Anacortes in 2019, and, and many of you heard me say this, was, you know, Ms. Hamilton explained to me, hey, Deborah, we've got 1,500 kids underneath the age of uh, five in Anacortes alone who don't have childcare. And these are, these are like Anacortes in reflection to the Skagit, our demographics are low. We don't have a lot of money. We're not making a lot of money. We're not living in big houses. We're not flowing with big, big uh, 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 taxes that can help address this issue. So one of the things that um, we really tackled as a team was addressing this the lack of childcare in our communities. Um, as Alex said, and thank you, Liz, the Fair Start for Kids um, really got kicked off the day after the state legislature ended last year. Um, Senator Wilson, Representative uh, Chop, uh, the past Speaker of the House and Representative Sen put up their sleeves and they travel across the state and they engage with cities, counties, labor, uh, chambers, et cetera. In fact, um, Representative Sen came up to Anacortes, she went up to Bellingham and to identify the needs, identify what the solutions are, what the recommendations are. And along came this great bill uh, that Senator uh, Wilson and Representative Sen passed, which was the Fair Start for Kids. And we've talked about that. One small one, and those who are also uh, county officials and also um, uh, city uh, officials, you, you might you might want to take a look and jot this bill down. House Bill 1331, which is uh, passed by Harris uh, Talley, incentivized childcare and lear early learning facilities by reducing impact fees. A and this is really important because we learned of the high impact fees in building our childcare centers or renovating current buildings. Currently, local governments can charge high impact fees for early learning and childcare facilities than commercial retail or office space. This dis disincentivizes the construction of new facilities and raises the cost of childcare. Uh, it's, it's a simple fact, and, and we, we've known this has been happening for a while. You know, House Bill 1331 fixes that problem by preventing local governments from charging higher impact fees for childcare and early learning facilities. It also allows local governments, so it's not all bad local government, it, all, <laughs> it also allows local government to completely exempt certain facilities that serve families with low incomes. And we have this in, in Anacortes and the Skagit. We have some of the lowest low income and in the Skagit alone, 40% of our communities is the Latino Hispanic community, which is our migrant farm workers who are making some of the lowest uh, wages out there. And then we have our service industry in Anacortes and San Juan County. So I go back to the demographics all the time. This provides local government with another tool to help increase child, child care capacities. So along with my colleagues moving forward, you know, I believe we need to continue to make investments in our districts and across the state. We need to increase access and affordability, and that means supporting our child care providers and our families. You know, I'm going to tell you all a little bit about my age, <laughs> just kind of like I'm, you know, I just turned 50 this year. My daughter's 17, you know, correct me, and Liz has little ones, and Alex's son is a little bit older than my daughter. Uh, you know, back in the day when I was putting my daughter into a child care facilities uh, with five other kids and a mom and pop's uh, operation, uh, the lady who raised my daughter and helped me, I was paying $900 a month. And then to go over to YMCA, I was paying $700 a month. So when we're talking about low income people, seven to $900 a month is half of the rent that we're paying in Skagit and Anacortes. Rent alone is what, 22 to $2,700 a month uh, for a two bedroom. Uh, how are we supposed to go to work and provide uh, and and um, provide for our children when all of our money is going into childcare and rent and the increase in taxes and then still have food on the table? 
So um, we heard it loud and clear. You can tell uh, the three of us are just parents uh, who are lawmakers. And we, we heard loud and care that child care is really important if we're gonna sustain in the 40th. Thank you guys very much. Um, okay, next question. Would you support or oppose a proposal for the state to override local zoning or density decisions to promote excuse me, to promote more affordability in housing construction. We'll start with Liz. Alex will have some, we're, we're both doing the housing stuff. So we'll, I'm sure we'll both have things to contribute. Um, so that's a real sticky wicket, right? Because Washington is very diverse in terms of, you know, what it's like to be rural in Eastern Washington or on the peninsula versus what it's like to be rural kind of closer to the Puget Sound urban core. Um, so when you talk about uh, a broad state level policy that is going to, you know, equally impact all of those different jurisdictions with their kind of inherent challenges that they have wherever they are um, is, we get a lot of pushback real quick from the Association of Washington Cities, the Association of Counties, et cetera, because one size fits all is really challenging to um, accomplish on the state level to, to override those, those local zonings. Plus it doesn't do anything for like, do you maybe have a historic district that you want to, uh, you know, kind of maintain its pattern of density, et cetera. Now, where I think we can make some improvements on that is I think we should be setting minimum density requirements for our high density zones. So like in Anacortes, we have our R4. I don't think we should be putting single family residencies back in a zone that is, is our only tiny area where we should be putting in multifamily. We haven't gotten there, nobody, I mean, we haven't proposed that yet. Um, I know that there's another question too about kind of that uh, nexus between the regulatory framework that we have, particularly around environmental stewardship and the ability to achieve affordable housing. So I figured I'd, I'd take a little bite out of that question as well. Um, this is something that I'm going to be devoting a lot of interim work on. Um, I'm the local government lead for this housing committee in the Senate, and we need to talk about GMA reform that hasn't been revisited since the 90s. Uh, we need to talk about our, our urban growth areas and find out where appropriate patterns of density are there. And um, one, we got a couple of bills out this year, but um, I'll be taking kind of a tour around the state for Lammers, their local areas of more intense re uh, residential development or rural development. So this is going to be like the Avalon proposal out in the Skagit, where you know you have a you have an area that basically is like its own little town. But we have to really be cognizant of the utility uh, infrastructure that is available, and you know what the what our goals are in reducing sprawl and not having you know a whole water system that is, is a one off in a rural area that's hard to serve and and maybe it's a homeowners association that has to maintain all of that infrastructure. Uh, so really being careful about um, ensuring that we are able to hit some of those affordability metrics. Um, but not giving up um, the ability to make sure that we are protecting our natural environment as we do so. And, and I just want to put this out as an invitation to any of you. I see we've got a SICPA member here, et cetera. This is something I'm really passionate about and we have um, the staffing uh, help over the interim. We'll probably start in September um, to continue to work on, on some of these GMA issues and how do, we, how do we bring that affordability in. I'm happy to do incentives. I mean, that was one of the cool things about the, the bill that uh, Deborah was just talking about, about the childcare facilities. They just matched it up with the state law that we already have about the siting of affordable housing. And so if you, like with the Anacors Family Center, they took advantage of um, the, you know, allowance that we have in state law that says we can exempt up to 80% of the impact fees. And that's what they're doing uh, as well with the childcare facilities. Um, trying to figure out, is there a way to create a paperwork and monitoring process that is less burdensome so we can do more inclusionary, inclusionary developments, um, particularly in, in multifamily. Uh, so, you know, or if you're doing a cottage clustering somewhere, you know, could, could developers get some kind of incentive if they're willing to dedicate say 10% of that development to, um, you know, maintaining affordability over time. So I think there's a lot of different ways we can approach this, but sadly one of, this is one of those kind of weirdly partisan issues. And so we stymie really quickly. And so for me, I wanna make sure that we're kind of taking the politics out and really looking at the brass tacks of how our land use codes um, get implemented over time and, and that relationship between the state and the local level. Um, and then the last thing I would say, or maybe I don't have anything else to say. I'll, I'll chime back in if Alex, <laughs> when it comes back, we'll let Alex get in there. Awesome, Alex. Thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, and then this is, you know, 
great example of why it's great to work with Liz and Deborah. Um, I, I, I frequently find myself um, talking after one or both of them and, uh, and not having a ton to add. On this, I would just I would just say, you know, I think it really is a balancing act and the, the broad brush that the state is able to paint with on housing is probably not the right the right way to approach um, increasing density um, in a, on a zone by zone basis. We need more housing. There's no question about that. We need um, more dense housing. We need uh, many smaller units in our communities uh, because that's what's gonna be affordable to um, a broader swath of the population. Um, and we need local governments to be active partners in figuring out the right places. I don't think the state should just sort of um, plop things down um, without the consultation of the, the local communities. Um, so, you know, one of the tools that we have um, and that we use this year is the Growth Management Act. Uh, we did we did pass um, an update to the housing, the requirement to uh, the next update for the housing chapters. So basically we're gonna ask the city and county governments to develop um, more, com uh, more comprehensive analysis to support the, um, the, the plan for housing in the community. Right now, um, the, the guidelines are pretty pretty broad and it's just sort of, do you have enough units? Um, what we really need is, do you have units for the incomes uh, that are already in the community? And a better analysis uh, along those lines, I think will go a long way towards encouraging the kind of density um, that, that, we're, that we're talking about. But I think there's also the other, the other piece there is that it's also, um, there's, there's market factors at play, some of which are just, is there really demand uh, for uh, diverse styles of housing? I believe pretty, uh, uh, pretty clearly that there are um, a lot of folks out there who's, um, you know, the best thing for them, uh, their, their preferred choice wouldn't be single family housing, but there is, um, you know, there aren't enough condos, there aren't enough townhouses uh, for, for everyone who wants them in our communities. But the market hasn't been as clearly demonstrated in a lot of places. And so if you're a developer, if you're a builder, um, the incentive is often to do what you've done successfully in the past and made money and not change. And so if we're asking folks to um, start developing those other housing forms, um, I think it's appropriate to prime the pump and uh, encourage uh, that kind of development with additional incentives. Um, so for example, that multifamily uh, tax exemption program I mentioned, I think is a great tool that we can be using uh, to try and encourage um, that, that additional kind of housing development. And I remembered what I wanted to add, and this is something uh, Deborah and I talked about quite a bit over the session, is especially under the auspices of doing GMA reform and uh, different conditions that the state is trying to put on for comprehensive plan updates. Uh, one thing that we hear loud and clear is not passing down unfunded mandates. So what we're trying to figure out is how to capitalize a program where not only uh, can the state put some skin in the game on ensuring that your comprehensive plan updates are incorporating kind of the vision that we're, we're trying to outline for the state, but also my hope over time would be that we would have an a, a additional account to help pay for the, the next development regulation update. Because what we find is that, you know, comprehensive uh, updates are, are visioning sessions, right? They're, they're kind of how we want to see ourselves grow, but your development regulations are how you actually accomplish that. And so I, I see us having a real need, um, especially as we continue to, to work towards this, um, you know, housing affordability and um, environmental stewardship matrix that we're, we're getting the development regulations up to speed. And that's a very expensive and burdensome process, um, having been through a comp plan update uh, as a council member. So that's another thing that we want to make sure that we're capitalizing over time. So that's part of what I'm hoping to get out of this work group is, is a sense of how the state can interplay and help the locals um, accomplish these planning documents. Thank you. Deborah. I don't have much more to add other than Liz, can we carpool when we go around and do the tour? So Liz and I have talked about partnering up on the GMA because her and I were, me on the House side, her on the Senate side on the GMA world. Uh, really worked hard in dipping into this on the work we did with Washington Strong, which would have provided the funding needed for the comprehensive plans. Uh, but we're gonna still continue working on that. But um, I, I agree with Liz and, and Alex, um, GMA and, and the conversation of density and infrastructure are really vital and important, especially to the 40th. Um, the situation that's happening up in Avalon, uh, having a conversation with that, Liz, maybe you and I could go up and, and uh, take a look at that 
and Alex and, and find out what's happening more on that. But yeah, I, I would love to be your co-pilot if you need someone to drive with you as we as you do these. But her and I both committed to working on GMA in the interim. So I'm really excited about that. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Looks like we might have time for one more question. So one thing that is brought up is, uh, quite a bit right now is hiring. Um, there are quite a few businesses in Anacortes that are unable to find staff to work. So they are having to reduce their hours of operation. So there's a ripple effect that's happening because of it. How will you work to address small business owners' concerns in regards to employment and also about making the higher minimum wage payments? We'll start with Liz. All right. Um, so this is one where I need your expertise and help uh, on, on navigating some of these questions. I mean, we're we're not all policy experts in every field, um, but having been a small business owner during the last recession, which was brutal, uh, we we moved locations. I had a baby and was pregnant with another one. And we moved we moved our, from our historic location that we've been in for forever downtown and tried to figure out how to weather that storm. And and during that particular time, I mean, we didn't have the PPP loans. We didn't have all of these other you know commensurate things. Um, but it was always hard for me to maintain staffing because it's just, it's, it's challenging to do that balance between like, you know, what's my take home going to be if I continue to have people, you know, manning the register. Um, so I'm, I'm, I do firmly believe that we need to graduate the minimum wage. It has to get higher because otherwise the, the net effects on our local economy tends to go down because people, if when they can't earn a living wage, you know, they're commuting back and forth. There's that, you know, congestion issues. There's the childcare issues. There's the housing affordability. I mean, this is all part of a suite of issues that come together that make for a, an environment where you can find folks to hire. Um, but I, I stand by ready and willing to listen if you have suggestions or things that you think would be helpful because this is where, you know, these relationships and these kinds of um, meetings like we're having right now really do impact the way that we develop policy and, and be advocates for our community over time. So while I would say I have no interest in lowering the minimum wage because I think that we're at a place where we really need people to be able to, be able to pay the rent, um, I'm, I'm interested in ways you think that um, we can help um, work on some of these things or, or what kind of response efforts, incentive, um, things that you can come up with. I'm, I'm open and willing. Uh, so we can continue that conversation. Thank you. I will most likely take you up on that. <laughs> Alex. Sure, I, I, I guess I, I think I'm again in agreement with uh, Senator Webley. Um, I, you know, in, in talking with business owners, I, I don't think you ever really talk to anybody who doesn't wish they were able to, to pay the folks that are working for them um, what they're worth. Um, doesn't want, you know, nobody wants to hear that their employees aren't able to make rent or aren't able to afford childcare, right? Um, the challenge is when you're in an industry with low wages, it's hard to be the only one that's, uh, that's paying, um, paying more. And so I, th I think the minimum wage has a ton of value there because it really does raise that floor and make sure everybody's um, not racing to the bottom. Um, the, and, and, and income inequality um, really does end up, as, as Liz was saying, it becomes a throttle on the economy. And that's why we're, when we've seen uh, communities that have um, stepped forward with higher, um, raising the minimum wage before others, um, we still don't see uh, decreases in um, economic activity in those communities because people have more, more money to spend. Um, and so the, the challenge is that transition period. Um, and so I think that, that idea of how do we graduate uh, those changes is, is really important. Um, we're also in a moment where, um, you know, workers are looking at um, having simultaneously been yelled at by customers who uh, were just being asked to wear their mask in compliance with public health guidelines. Um, they've had, you know, they've been taking personal risk to come to work. Um, they've been held up as, um, um, you know, our sort of heroes and um, I think we have to sort of recognize that the labor market is is shifting um, in some significant ways. 
Um, and I'm, I'm very open to, um, as uh, was mentioned, I'm, I'm pretty open to hearing um, how we can help bridge some of those difficulties uh, between you know, the labor market and employers. Um, Cause I think there is, um, I mean, it, if you follow social media on this stuff, there's, uh, there's a lot of conversations happening in this space and I, I don't think it's a settled uh, question. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, just wrapping up, um, I agree with both of my colleagues. I think uh, the handout here, Jessica, is to say, you know, maybe there's an opportunity in the interim, Liz and Alex, kind of talk a little bit more about, you know, some of these conversations that we're having and to hear from you. I, I think Liz is absolutely right and Alex is absolutely right. Uh, minimum wage is not a new issue. Minimum wage during a recession is not a new issue. But finding solutions and hearing from all of you here helps develop the policy that's going to drive us and how we're going to be able to vote and be able to protect what's needed uh, in the 40th. Um, our waterways touch also, you know, maybe Liz and Alex, we extend out to the 42nd, the 10th and the 39th. And there's a way where the chambers can kind of talk through all of these different situations of where we need to look at legislature for 2022 and then what we need to be able to do to protect the integrity of the north end of Snohomish. And I think seeing that Liz and Alex and I have a great relationship, we also have that with the, the 10th, the 39th and the 42nd. And we often all meet together to make sure that we're, we're coordinating both Republican and Democratic. So um, when it comes to you know putting people to work, workforce development, minimum wages, et cetera, I think we find more of a common ground together in our, in our, in our Democratic and our House and in our Senate, in our Democratic and our Republican and our House and our Senate. And Jessica, we, um, Liz said it perfectly. Uh, let's meet with you. Let's see if maybe you can develop a round table uh, by Zoom is great. And we just have a broader conversation about uh, where we need to go in 2022 and what we need to be doing better. But it, uh, um, it's a tough issue, but it's, can't be an issue for all working together. We can find solutions. Love it, thank you. Is there um, a specific state committee that works uh, around employment or staffing for businesses? Probably the Labor and Commerce Committee. Yeah, and, and just to um, you know, kind of dovetail on what Deborah just said, we really do a lot of bipartisan work. Um, you know, our district is surrounded by um, you know, there's there's a couple swing districts around us, but but some fully Republican districts, and we just try to work together to figure out what we can, how we can collaborate on things that are best for the whole of our region. Um, and so I'm really proud of of the bipartisan work that we have done um, on the transportation and infrastructure side of things, um, on the capital requests. You know, we work together with the 39th and the 10th delegation to get the the funding for the Duguallich Wellness Center. So really want to give a shout out to those, um, you know, folks that are, are surrounding our district because we really do our best to come together as a, a full delegation that represents multiple interests to bring that to the table. I mean, there's there's some issues that we're just never going to agree on. And, you know, those, those I, we can probably all list it, but most everything else we do is bipartisan. And I think all three of us have had um, good, strong bipartisan votes on legislation that we've passed. Um, so real quick, I wanted to mention, um, Bridget just posted in there the direct emails for all three of the reps. So if you have questions, input, anything you want to send to them, go ahead and copy and paste those. Um, I, I think I'm going to take you guys up on the offer and put together a roundtable on employment and, and invite you guys back so that way we can talk to the business owners and get some solutions out of it. I love that. Um, yeah, Jessica, maybe expand it too. Like you've got some great questions here and maybe not all these questions, but you've had some great, like, thank you for sending us the questions beforehand, but there might be the broader conversation that it looks like we need. Like, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in and I certainly didn't mean to tell you like as staff, but I, I think we're going to talk about like the, the, um, the minimum wage, unemployment, what we can do to increase small business. What are we looking at for, for 2022? Um, not, not that we we can do it all, but I think certainly because I'd love to hear from all of you. I'd love to hear from Tim, Danny, Ron, Kevin, Jason. Like I'd love to be able to have a listening session, have them talk about what they're learning with us, because they're like all your voices mean so much. And I'm I'm sorry we don't get to see all your happy smiling faces today. 
And I mean, a great example of that was we did a listening tour with the Bellingham Chamber, and that's where that Main Street bill that Rep. Rule did came directly from a listening session that we had uh, with the Bellingham Chamber. So while we can't, uh, you know, there's there's no guarantees in this business, but um, being good listeners is the cornerstone. Fantastic. So I'm not seeing um, any other questions coming in. So for wrap up, uh, did you guys want to say some final words here? And we'll start with Liz. Nope. <laughs> She's like, where I start with me? <laughs> Just uh Keep, keep those emails coming, keep those phone calls coming. Um, you know, we, we really are problem solvers and we're trying to cover a lot of ground. Um, but you know, this is, we, I'm a buy local girl all the way. So I'm down in my local businesses, you know, as, as frequently as I can. And so, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I love my community here and I'm, I'm here and ready to serve. Thank you, Alex. Well, thanks, thanks again for the, uh, the opportunity to, to come connect um, and looking forward to the, to the follow-up uh, roundtable. That sounds like a great idea. Um, I, I would just take one second here and note um, there were two or three questions uh, that we didn't get to about the transportation package. I know that's something that's uh, big on a lot of folks' minds. Um, and I guess our sort of working uh, theory right now is that there's... Um, a, uh, a evolving plan for a transportation package. Uh, there's agreement uh, to a large extent on a lot of the spending priorities that would include priorities uh, in Anacortes, like Commercial Avenue, uh, making sure we uh, build up both our Washington uh, State Ferry System um, and the uh, Glamis Island Ferry replacement. Um, those kinds of priorities would come as part of a transportation package. There is still uh, realistic hope uh, that we could uh, put together an agreement on the spending. Uh, the spending plan is the easy part. The hard part is where's the money come from. Um, that gets a little bit easier, especially if there's a federal um, infrastructure bill that would support that. And so um, fingers crossed that that can still happen this year. Um, yeah, look forward to connecting again soon. Thanks. And so Alex, are you thinking best case scenario that the transportation package could possibly pass next session? Um, I, I, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that we could have a special session later this year where we allocate federal money um, and, uh, and then also uh, pass whatever local revenue is needed to fill the. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, um, I'm just going to say uh, one big word that I love to hear all the time is infrastructure. Alex, thank you for uh, the transportation. A uh, little bit of a um, bump there on that question. Infrastructure and transportation is an incredible priority, I think, for us in the 40th. It's jobs, it's money, it helps us build our communities, helps us build it right. I, I think that um, coming back for a special session in September, uh, Liz, that means we need to get our kids ready because they'll probably start school and we'll be in, in Olympia. Uh, so we got to figure out that in Labor Day weekend scheduling. Um, but uh, I think that the transportation package needs to pass in September. It's a big win-win for us and we need to get that going. It helps our small businesses. I'm looking forward to working with you, Jessica, and the rest of the chambers on this. Uh, just uh, really wrapping up. I think one of the unique things that I love working about Liz and Alex who work with all industries. When Liz and I were working on Washington Strong, the agriculture community looked at Liz and I and they're like, wow, on the work of climate change and uh, carbon tax tax and, and um, green bonding, no one's come to talk to us in the agriculture community, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Liz and I sat down and talked with refineries. Alex has conversation with refineries also, but we we're working on Washington Strong refineries said the same thing. Thank you for coming and talking to us. No one, no one's ever come down and talked to us. And I think that just really respects the reflects the integrity of Alex and Liz and being able to to work with them. Is uh, every industry is important to us. Um, every area of the governmental service that we need to vote on is vital. Each one of us have our buckets we carry, and we trust one another uh, when it comes to um, what are we going to do when it comes to this situation. So. I have a great team. I'm really happy and I look forward to working with you guys on good next steps forward. Fantastic. Well, thank you all again for making time and speaking with us here in Anacortes and we will be in touch soon. And thank you to all who attended to watch, learn and listen. Bye guys. <laughs>